or actually I hit the go live button. <laughs> so we're live now. <laughs> we're live. We're live. Hi, everybody. From Hinesburg, Vermont and Catskill, New, New York. York. Underground. This is Underhill Underground. <laughs> so, yeah, Lance wrote a great blog post. This blog post was about urban light painting. And Lance, you want to lead us in? Yeah, sure. Um, National parks at night, you know, the name sort of implies majestic landscapes and wilderness, but, and that's where we spend most of our time and do a lot of our workshops. Um, but a lot of my own personal night photography history is photographing in urban and industrial environments. And that's, you know, that's, that's a, an oeuvre or a genre that has uh, been held a lot of appeal for me uh, over a long, long period of time. And when you photograph in the urban environment, it's, you know, it's obviously very different for a number of reasons. Um, the conditions are different, the, you know, rather than having natural light, moonlight, starlight, what have you, you've got, um, you know, any number of, of potential light sources, uh, artificial lights and natural. Uh, and they're all different colors. So it just presents um, a wealth of opportunities um, or a wealth of frustrations, depending on how you approach photographing it. Um, you know, the opportunities are if you, uh, if you love working with color and the frustrations are if you're trying to correct for the multitude of, of different light sources and try to make everything look natural or, or, or neutral. Um, then if you go and, and add the extra layer of light painting on top of that, it either complicates or intensifies, uh, you know, what you've got to work with there. So, um, I've been wanting to get out and do more urban night photography, industrial night photography for a while. It's, it's been uh, like I said, it's something I've done for a long, long time, but haven't done that much of lately. So just started going through images and uh, looking at some from, from years past and thinking about um, putting them together in, into this post about how to approach adding light to a situation that may already be fairly brightly lit. Uh, good practice during shut-in like this. Let's, let's mm -hmm. jump in and take a look at some of those images. All righty. So, um, yeah, I, you jump off and you start by saying, you know, that there's some ideal situations that includes moonlit landscapes, right? Yeah. Um, well, just comparing, this is comparing the differences between what you, the challenges that you find mm -hmm. in a, in a moonlight landscape. Um, it's funny. I, I shot during full moons. i I guess I started shooting during full moons in urban and suburban areas where there's like light on light on light. Right, and we started with film too, which of course is so very different from shooting digitally. Right. So that, that kind of plays into it as well. Yeah. Um, you know, back, back in the film days, we were much more limited in what we were able to shoot. You know, the, there was no such thing as, as Milky Way photography or, you know. Right dark sky or crescent moon photography. We went out when the moon was full or we went into mm -hmm. the city. And uh, yeah. So anyway, the moonlight photography is pretty easy for light painting. It's, it's a, a consistent, relatively low contrast light source. And you can, you've got lots of shadows to work with and fill in with light painting. Um, photographing by no moonlight in an astro landscape, starry sky situation presents different challenges because you're working with short exposures to keep your stars as points. Uh, you're working at wide apertures and high ISOs, which mean that you need a really dim light source to be able to control it. So, mm. um, you know, in the last, uh, I don't know, five, six, seven years or so, people have been using the low level landscape lighting technique by placing a very dim continuous light source in the frame uh, or multiple light sources 
as a way to manage lighting a whole scene in a 15 or 20 second exposure. You know what I find really funny about that? And I think you're making the point here in, in this, this blog post. And if you didn't, I'm, I'm going to draw the connection anyway. That's what happens in cityscapes. There's a whole bunch of constantly on, sometimes dim, sometimes bright points of light, crazy dynamic ranges there. But, but yeah, you're, you're dealing with some variables you just can't change. Yeah, and that's that's the that's the perfect segue into working in the urban environment is that you've got a lot of different light sources, uh, continuous light sources with a crazy, intense dynamic range um, potential for that as as well as colors. I mean that so that's the thing is you've got lots of different light sources with lots of different colors, but you also have oftentimes. Uh, a, a sea of darkness punctuated by little points of light, which leave lots of shadows and therefore opportunity to fill in those shadows. Mm. So this image here, uh, made along the Plymouth waterfront in Plymouth, Massachusetts. Um, I, you know, it's, it's not the world's greatest image, but it's really good for illustrating the point here um, of the approach to working in this kind of environment. You really figuring out your exposure, your ambient exposure first is generally evolves around picking the highlights that you want to preserve and making your base exposure around that. You decide, you know, what's the most important highlight in this scene that you want to have detail exposed for that and then let the rest of the scene do what it will. And in this case, I exposed for that building in the background on the right side of the frame which meant that the building in the foreground on the left side of the frame was really dark and underexposed. Ha ha, he says, there is an opportunity for light painting. And, um, you know, it's the techniques are the same. The lighting techniques are the same. It's, you can see that it is lit from an oblique angle on the left-hand side and the light is kind of scraped across the building and it highlights the beautiful texture of that cinder block wall and the ivy growing up the side of the building there. So, wow. uh, you know, and you'll notice different colors too. Sorry, I jumped oh, sorry. out. We, we can talk about that on another image because that, that okay. goes in there as well. So um, here's, this is another image from, uh, from Plymouth. This is Burial Hill Cemetery in, uh, just in downtown Plymouth, up on a hill, as the name implies. Some of the pilgrims are buried there. Um, they're graves that date back to uh, the, what, very early 18th century. There might be a few, yeah, well, it's pilgrims, yeah, there are a few from the, from the late 17th century. But um, to the image here, um, you, can, you see the, the orange glow in the trees, the purplish color in the sky, and that kind of gives away that there's a lot of sodium vapor lights around the area um, and that they're, that purplish color in the sky that it's, and it's fairly light indicates that it was shot during moonlight conditions. Because if that were without moonlight, then that sky would be pretty dark, you know, not much detail and, and mostly black. Mm. But the gravestones in the foreground were relatively dark and mostly in shadow. And to uh, emphasize or to add a, you know, a, a dramatic or a, a spooky feel to them, um, I went with some backlighting and I purposely chose a cool or daylight balanced LED light that would contrast pretty sharply with the very warm sodium vapor lights that, that kind of permeated the area. Um, and they are mostly, uh, you know, in, mostly indirect, but you can see there's a little bit of direct lighting falling on those gravestones from the, uh, the, the shadows of the trees on there. Yeah. Love it. So, so that's, that's mixed lighting. Um, you know, that combination of, of all the lighting in the area just falling on there and backlighting with a flashlight. All right, well, this is fun. So this, this, is, this is just one photograph um, processed three different ways here. 
And it's basically, I think you wrote a, a blog post about the relationship of white balance and how it affects ambient and added light in the same shot, didn't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I did a whole bunch of color temperature blending tests. So, um, so this image is again, primarily sodium vapor street light and mostly daylight balanced uh, LED flashlight. And on the left side there, it's um, setting the white balance to tungsten. Uh, no, so, um, sorry, that's setting the white balance to daylight. So the white balance is set for the flashlight on the figure in the foreground, which makes the sodium vapor really very warm in the background. And then on the other side of the frame, the, the right side, it's, uh, that's the tungsten daylight, uh, tungsten white balance setting. So the daylight uh, flashlight is a little bit cool and you've got that, you know, it's somewhat warm in the background and somewhat cool in the foreground. And then same white balance in the middle image there. Again, that's the tungsten setting, which mostly but not completely neutralizes the sodium vapor. Um, but um, I did a little post-processing tomfoolery on the on the uh, subject, the figure in the foreground there, to make that flashlight be also tungsten balanced. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you know, it's not that there's a right or a wrong way, right? It, you know, it's, it's whatever works for you, but um, choosing your light source in the field is the point here, you know, taking into consideration what the surrounding light, color temperature of the light is. Do you want your light painted subject to blend in or stand out and uh, you know, pick a light source that either matches or contrasts with the color temperatures of the surrounding lights? Which one's your favorite? Um, well, the one on the the one on the right is the way that I've always processed that image, um, and the way that I've been living with it. So, um, yeah, I'm gonna go with that. Got it. I like the tomfoolery one in the middle. Oh uh, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I, I guess it's um, using a light source that blends with the background when you're using dramatic backlighting, probably does not the best example of having a, a light painted subject blend in with the background, but at least color wise it does. Yeah, I got you. Yeah, that makes sense. I, using color balance to create tension is really what you're talking about. Yeah. Tension, mood, atmosphere, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. whatever, whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah. So, oh, hey, by the way, um, yeah. I made a local adjustment brush selection of the area that was lit with the flashlight. And then I used the new hue slider, the hue adjustment in Lightroom uh, to change the color. And it works really well for that. Nice. So um, that's another uh, thing I've been kind of toying with doing a post on that because it's, um, it's a pretty useful tool. Uh, it, I think it's going to take a lot of people a while to figure out what to do with it. Right. But yeah, he, he was a strange one to play with. He was definitely strange. I'm going to take a break right here for a second before we go to the next image and just say, Hey everybody, thanks for joining us. Uh, I see a couple of comments just saying hello in the chat. We appreciate it. Um, if you haven't subscribed yet, hit the subscribe button and we really appreciate it. If you hit the like button and leave comments and stuff. And we'll go back to talking about the images now. That's it. Just wanted to say, say thanks in the ways that, that help us. Appreciate it. So next image here. All right. Next image, uh, Providence, Rhode Island. And um, you can see a, a pattern developing here. Again, we've got, and this is actually this pattern that's developing is kind of giving away that these are some older images too because they're mostly lit with sodium vapor, which as you know, has largely been replaced in most urban areas with LED lighting these days. Mm. But back in the day, um, you know, sodium vapor was the go-to light for, for just about everybody. Yeah, kind of that color. <laughs> this color? 
that it's color. color. Oh. Yes. <laughs> so anyway, what what caught what caught my eye in this scene were you know these cool smokestacks with the red lights on them, and then that little pinkish red light in the window on the mm. left side of the frame. And I was sitting there waiting for that SUV to uh, pull out of there. There were some people in there and I thought maybe they were going to take off, but no, they, they took off, but they left the car behind. So the composition that I wanted to do wasn't going to work. And I, I, I couldn't really see a way around excluding it from the scene. Um, so let's, let's take a, a really bright flashlight and make it look like a car is coming up behind it and simulate headlights, car headlights, by holding it down low and shining it forward on the back of that car. So it kind of caught the edge of the tire and the bumper and lit up the street light. And um, again, it's, it's a contrasting color using that, that white LED against the overall low. Oh, and to back to the point I made earlier about the uh, the graveyard image with the moonlight in the sky. You could see the the color in the sky was a combination of moonlight and the cumulative effect of all the ambient light around there, which gave you this kind of lightish purple color. Mm. Here in, you know, like I said, there's no moonlight, so it's much, much darker and almost black. It's hard to here, so the, here the balance in figuring out that ambient exposure is not blowing out the highlights in the background, but also giving it enough exposure so that those black smokestacks separated from the black sky. I love the, the reds and the purples palette yeah. is, is just pervasive in this image. And then you throw in those splashes of orange. Excellent. I love the color work. Thank you. Uh, oh, what else we got? What else we got here? Did you make these circles? I did not. So somebody made not. a Zen rock garden near an underpass. <laughs> yeah, this this is the uh, the Leonard P. Zakem Bridge in Boston, which was a um, one of one of the locations that I always took my New England uh, School of Photography night photography classes to. Um, and it was it was both a joy and an interminable frustration to work here. Uh, so many dramatic lines and shapes and things to photograph. It was, so it was great subject subject wise, but right under this highway was insanely noisy. It was impossible to to hear anybody, let alone hear yourself think. But um, so. During this is part of that whole big dig project that Boston went through about 15 years ago, and um, when they completed the the bridge and and uh, you know the surrounding area, um, there was a period of a couple of years where you know they hadn't prettied up anything. Yeah, it was it was functional, but um, they hadn't done much with the surrounding environment. And now it's there's a skate park there. There's a bunch of sculptural art installations. Um, and there's some pretty decent lighting as well. Mm. Um, and one, one of those art installations was this, uh, this labyrinth that some, they, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure this was a commissioned piece in this, and it's basically gravel, you know, it's like a, a foot deep pile of, of gravel down there. Uh -huh. um, and uh, just raking that low flashlight across the edge, surface of it brought out all of the, the, those round lines and shapes contrasted against the, the rigid, heavy concrete structures there. Mm. So this is, this is um, a pretty heavy crop of this image to, to kind of fit with the, within the blog post header. But um, in the original image, you could see a lot more of the, that superstructure of the highway going up over the top of it mm. but yeah so anyway these are a, a, you know a couple of different examples of ways that you can incorporate light painting into a brightly lit environment uh, yeah all right so in your wrap up let's just run through your your bullet points here because i think you made some really great points 
Right. Well, when you're out in the landscape in a par- in a national park or you know just a natural environment, the there's generally not a whole wide variety of light to work with, and you know unless you're at twilight or sunset or sunrise or you know um, once it's dark, it's dark, and and you've got the subject in front of you, and you know oftentimes you you will add the light to make it really make the image sing. But in the urban environment, um, light can be the thing that grabs your attention before subject matter. And I find that to be really often the case. So rather than looking for stuff to photograph, I look for interesting light in the, in the city environment or in, in the industrial image uh, uh, environment. So that's, um, you know, that's, that's where I tend to uh, point the camera. Um, rather than than subject first it's light first so um smaller scenes more more intimate scenes uh little little vignettes often are easier to control um and manage the uh the extreme scene contrast or dynamic range that you get with these you know like i said uh dark sea of darkness punctuated with little points of light Mm -hmm. so by uh, looking at those smaller scenes and avoiding light sources in the frame, that's a, a good way to manage that contrast. So um, unless you are looking for even monochromatic light, go out and, and allow yourself to be drawn into scenes where you've got multiple light sources lighting different surfaces within a small area. So sometimes when they overlap, like in that Plymouth uh, graveyard image, that makes for some pretty interesting lighting. But oftentimes you'll have one surface that's lit with one light and another surface lit with a different color light, and then something in the shadow in the foreground that gives you the opportunity for lighting. So, um, you know, you can always include a street light in the scene if it's if it works with the image, but um, in general, it causes more problems than, uh, than solutions in, in most of the time. So I'll often exclude lights from the frame either by putting them behind a, a street sign or a tree or, or whatever is in the, in the scene, um, which can create the backlighting or, or rim lighting or glow that you might find, uh, you know, from any any kind of backlit situation, right? So, um, lastly, uh, yeah. quite all right. Last, lastly, in there, um, the amount of light that you're working with, the amount of exposure that you're working with, is really different too. And you know, we're used to being ISO 6400 in 15 seconds and in you know wide open apertures. But you don't have that limitation. You're, you're most of the time you're better off shooting at your camera's native ISO because it can handle the wider dynamic scene dynamic range uh, of light at native ISO, and there's no need to cut your exposure. Uh, you know, to shoot wide open, you can stop down to f/8, give yourself a comfortable time to work with. Um, uh, I, I, living in New York City for a decade, I remember. I couldn't get an exposure longer than a minute without adding neutral density. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So well, yeah. Close. I mean, th- well, Times Square, handheld night photography, no problem. You know, yeah. At, yeah. you know, at probably at 400 ISO is all you need, and you could do you know a fraction of a second. Crazy. But, I wanted a minute. I wanted two minutes. I wanted five minutes. I couldn't yeah. get it without throwing ND on. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, you know, Times Square or you know some like creepy abandoned industrial site you have pretty different light levels but you know, both present different opportunities right i'm just talking the waterfront like if i wanted to do like star trails inside new york city i could not stop down enough even at iso 100 or iso low to go longer than a minute there's just right so you got to stack those suckers light. yeah which which leads you to your other point which is you need to bring a lot more light to that game it's yes. got to be much brighter light to fill in those shadows or to create highlights. 
Right, because you got to think about what you're competing with, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, hey. But... That's, that's why I brought flashes. So at that point, I used speed lights. Speed lights with gels. Like, just walk around, pop, 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 pop. Yeah, you know, it's, it's my tendency to go off on a history tangent here, but... Uh... <laughs> Do it. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, as the the technology the camera digital technology was developing you know so were flashlights and we went from having you know the brightest possible flashlight you could have in you know 1985 was a was a 4d cell mag light but um you know surefire and streamlight kind of led the way and these smaller battery xenon lights that were so much brighter and and more, more compact than what we'd had to work with and they were perfect for that kind of photography but you know kind of useless for uh iso 6400 unless you're trying to you know send a beam up into space or light up the side of a mountain right yeah but the tools that that uh tools have evolved and adapted to present different opportunities for us well, no one's going to argue that technology has always driven what people do with photography. True. Absolutely true. Yep. But, uh, hey, I'm thinking there's one more thing that we should uh, mention tonight, at, at least for the people in the live stream. You know, it might be a little bit late for people watching this six months from now, but there's something happening tonight, right? Tomorrow night? Um, both nights. Both nights. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unusual. Unusual to have a... Uh, Perseids Milky Way meteor shower, so Milky Way shower, a meteor shower that has uh, equal meteors per hour both nights. So the peak really happens over two nights, tonight and tomorrow night. Pretty much the same number of meteors are supposed to be zipping through the sky. And uh, here on the East Coast, we were looking at this with trepidation over the last week because it's like rain, thunderstorms, rain, thunderstorms. You've got thunder outside your house right now, don't you? Yeah, you might have heard a, a bolt or two uh, a minute ago. Right before we went on, I looked outside and it's clear as a bell for me. Can you imagine how how I'm like inside of me is going chop, 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 chop. Like, I gotta get out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Get out there. But, 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 but before you do, we've got to tell them about something that might help them photograph. I will. I will. Okay, I will. good. I'll put, I'll put it on screen. I'll take Excellent. people there. Excellent. Oh. Yeah. So the Perseids meteor shower comes around every year. It's one of the, the most anticipated, one of the, the biggest events. And it's um, partially because it's in the summertime when you don't have to go out and freezing cold to, to photograph. But this year, it promises to be a pretty good display um, if you've got clear skies, especially because there's no moonlight out there. So we really want to encourage you guys to, uh, to go out, find yourself some dark skies, get away from the city and the urban, urban lights we were just talking about, and to get yourself set up to do some meteor shower photography. So, I was just trying to like copy and paste stuff and make sure that everybody has the right link. I'm putting it in here. So like it's, I'm putting it in the chat. It'll end up in the description. It's npan.co slash meteors. Um, so yeah, that and will then, lead you to a place where you can, if I find the screen sharing, if you go there, you're going to see a page that looks like this. It says national parks at night meteor shower guide. There's words and stuff that you can read, but bottom line, this is a 49 page ebook. This ebook has a great tutorial on how to plan for, how to shoot and how to post process meteor showers, plus info on 12 meter meter showers, some dream locations. I think Lance, you had a heavy hand in that one, right? And, and a gear guide. So this is chock full of information uh, about it. So, um, this is currently a pay what you will opportunity. So you can pay nothing, you can pay something, or you can be very generous and some people have, and we thank you so much. Um, so please go to npan.co slash meteors or follow the link in the description and grab yourself a copy of this guide or buy one for a friend of yours. 
Um, and if you can go out yeah. tonight and tomorrow night and photograph the proceeds meteor shower. Yes. Um, and if you're seeing this at a later date, it does come around every August and there are several other meteor showers worth of note each year to, to work with, but it's, um, it's an exciting and rewarding thing to photograph and to see and experience. So we hope you've got some clear dark skies wherever you are to go out. For and... truth. And yeah. I, can, I, can, I, can, I can even show you guys, if you go into photo pills, uh, this is in there, but if you look in photo pills, they're gonna show you um, all of the meteor showers. This is one of the pills that you have inside of it called meteor showers. You can look on, tap on the calendar, you can look into next year. And the most important thing to see here is that power bar. You see the power bar, that blue bar next to the Perseids here? That means that it's going to be a freaking awesome opportunity. So if you can, walk outside. If there's clouds, just stand outside and huff and puff and blow. Make those clouds go away because <laughs> this is a good one. The Geminids is the next strongest one this year in December. So if you tap into that, you'll see there's a lot of good stuff going on. Um, so, yeah. Uh, it just started there. pouring here. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that means it'll be over soon, and you'll you'll be able to see through those clouds because they won't be there. Just get it out of the way. Get all that mm -hmm. raining done. Maybe so. Yeah. If not, we can work on our our, our uh, reaction videos to Phil Collins tunes. Is this the thing now? That is the thing. Yes. The Fair the. Uh, the number one video on YouTube this week, and it's so so much the thing that it's like front page headlines on every media major news channel is uh two young black guys listening to um some 1980-ish phil collins hit and and talking about how dope it is you know what I've, I've seen them doing reaction videos to other music and i i enjoy them their reaction videos are awesome yeah yep. but yeah it's i didn't know it was phil collins this week it's become a whole genre. I love it. Yeah. Reaction videos. So we should make reaction videos. To night so, photographs. To night photographs. And do you think they'll get 20 million views? No. And... <laughs> but this is not a scale no, thing. I mean, like, yeah. we're doing this because we love it, not because other people love it. So, yeah. I mean, some well, people love it. <laughs> we, do, we do appreciate the people who come and, and uh, sit with us and spend time with us every week. So thanks to all of you guys. Thank you. So, any um, any questions or things we need to uh, address before we Scanning. wrap up? There's only one page of chat out there. Because they're all out there doing the Perseids. Sandra says, I love sodium vapor lights. Sodium vapor dreams. Yes. My favorite hashtag. A bunch of people say hello. Steven said thunderstorms, sad face. Aww. And Sandra is heading out to shoot it tomorrow night. I hope someplace fabulous. All right. Well, there's no other questions. We can give you guys like a virtual hug, a COVID safe hug. <laughs> so Lance, it's been great. Thanks for the, the, the walk down memory lane in the, Oh, Oh, Hadley, Hadley. I was just about to wrap up, but Hadley, Hadley with the question for photographic purposes is the meteor is the meteor shower over as a practical matter as the moon starts to rise above the horizon. Yeah. Yeah. It depends I mean, how much moon it is, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. Good point. Uh, I think it's what 40% now, something like that. Um, yeah. It depends on how like the, with the Perseids, it's, it's basically North Northeast. So the so, moon yeah, comes up over moon. here and then comes behind. So it's not like in the field of the meteors or the origin, uh, or the radiant. So it can, I know that when you and I were in um, Great Sand Dunes, it greatly affected it because it was a full moon. It came up and it's just like, no yeah. more meteors, but there's the dunes. Um, a little yeah. bit of gentle moon can, can leave meteors in the sky. Yeah, it's like, you know, dim stars and bright stars were under moonlight, right? Yeah. The giant fireballs will still be there, but. Yep. There are fewer of them. Yep. So get your shooting in before the moon comes up. Keep your shutter going until the moon comes up so you can get something to layer in. Yeah. And then let it go a little while longer so you've got some light for your foreground. Yep. And you can read all about that in our ebook. Yeah. A lot of 
<laughs> wow. So we just got a lot more. So Ken, oh, that's funny. Ken jumped in and said Hadley has a question. Uh, great to see Suzanne says great to see stuff. And Marina says good to see people. And there's no more questions. Oh, and Suzanne and Marina, I think were there underneath. I know I've shot with both of them underneath the Zaken Bridge. They may or may not have been there for that particular image, but that's great. Hey guys, um, miss shooting with you. So, well, I got to go pack up my batteries that were charging and go catch some meteors because I don't hear any thunder outside of my bunker here in Catskill. So, um, right, keep well, your fingers forward. crossed for me. Looking forward to seeing those images. Thanks, man. Fingers crossed. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great night. Stay safe. Do the things you love, and be nice to other people. Do we? Do we have a? Um, do we have an Instagram tomorrow night? We always. It's either tomorrow night or Thursday. It really depends. Like it. It depends on who's going to be shooting where. We believe that either Chris or myself or whoever's going to be out shooting tomorrow night could be streaming shooting the meteor shower live oh cool excellent so fingers crossed check us out on instagram tomorrow and it's like shake the dice let's see who's getting the good shoot on and has cell service <laughs> right on yeah all right good night matt thanks man good see night. you everybody take it easy lance good night everybody bye internet